of Genesis in chapter number 24. This is what's been on my heart now for a couple of days. Genesis in chapter number 24. The longest chapter of the book of Genesis. I don't believe it's by accident or coincidence that it is. It's almost right directly in the middle of the book of Genesis. 50 chapters there and this is the 24th chapter and 67 verses of this chapter. You say, why would God spend so much chapter dealing with a seemingly insignificant story? Well, there's nothing insignificant about the story that we'll be preaching from this morning. We find at the beginning of chapter 24 that Abraham is old and the Bible says well stricken in years and he calls his servant, his eldest servant born in his house and he says I want to send you back to Mesopotamia. I want to send you back to where God called me out from and I want you to go take a wife for Isaac. I want you to go get a bride for Isaac. And the servant does exactly what Abraham asks. He travels this long journey, goes into this Gentile country to bring out a bride for his Jewish son. You can't miss the beautiful, wonderful pictures of that. It's a picture of God sending the Holy Ghost to call out a Gentile bride for his Jewish son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we find that this man comes a long ways to get this woman. This, this man who we know as to be most likely Eliezer. Uh, if you look at a Bible map how far he comes from where Abraham is at by the well Lehiroi all the way up into the country of Mesopotamia. He, he, he goes over 400 miles. And I ain't talking 400 miles in a Cadillac on I-85 stretching it out at 90 miles an hour hoping the state patrol don't pull you over. I'm talking about over 400 miles in primitive condition on camels carrying supplies with you, uh, primitive roads, uh, primitive travel. It would have taken months for him to get from where Abraham is all the way up to where this woman, Rebecca, is going to be. He has endured a lot. He has went through a lot, and he does so just to give one person a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to come and meet Isaac. I want you to notice one verse with me, but don't close your Bible, uh, because we'll preach down through here this morning. Look at verse number 58. Genesis 24 verse 58, all of this servant's efforts, all of his great expense, all of his endurance, it will all culminate in verse 58 when he pops this question to Rebecca. Verse 58, and they called Rebecca and said unto her, wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. The best decision that this woman ever makes in her entire life is this decision in the text. She has no idea, Brother Cody, that this is going to be a totally, not just life-altering, this is going to be an eternity-altering choice. We're going to find out after a while by the end of the message this is going to change the course of history and nations and peoples because of one woman looking at one man and the question being asked, wilt thou go with this man? And I'm not sure at the time that she said yes. At the time, Brother Jack, when she said here in the text, when she said, I will go, Brother Collins, I'm not really sure she understood how important and how much was hanging on this woman one little answer, I will go. I don't really think, I mean, I think in her mind she knew I'm getting a pretty good deal. But she had no idea that she was getting in on the little end of something big. Way out yonder in her life somewhere, she's going to turn around and look back and she's going to say, that was the greatest day of my life. And that was the greatest decision that I ever made. I think to myself, 
herself, Brother Matthew, maybe she would sit there and look back in her life and think, my, 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 how quickly and how easily it would have been for things to have gone a totally different direction. I can still be out yonder leaving with them Gentiles, being lost without God, knowing not the God of Abraham. But thank God for that one day when God pricked my heart and the Holy Ghost said, you better take this choice. You better get in on this deal. This is a good deal. And she said, you know what? I will go with this man. And, and can I say, brother, the greatest decision I ever made in my life, it wasn't to marry that little Georgia peach, even though that was a great decision. It wasn't to have children. It wasn't even to take Bible Missionary Baptist Church and accept your offer to be pastor. The greatest decision I ever made was one night as an 18-year-old boy down yonder in Pembroke, Georgia, when the Holy Ghost came by my way and showed me Jesus and showed me my lost condition. And he said, will you go with this man? And I said, I believe I will. I will go. Brother Danny, we had no idea when we made that little trip to an altar and said whatever little prayer we prayed. We had no idea just what it was going to do in our life. We had no idea we was getting in on something huge. But we look back now and we realize, thank God, thank God, we could have died and went to hell. We could have been lost without Christ. But here we sat saved. Here we sat born again. And it was the greatest choice we ever made. I mean, I mean, I thought to myself, she'd have been crazy not to. <laughs> Y'all, you would be crazy not to accept God's offer of mercy to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You'd be crazy not to. I thought to myself, little this brother Hyde, how nuts would this woman could have been to look at everything laid out for her up till verse 58 and say, nah, no thanks, I'm doing pretty good. She'd been crazy, brother Charlie. I mean, do y'all know, let me just throw this out real quick, real fast. Do y'all know she accepts this because she looks at all the factors? What does she see? She sees he's rich. <laughs> this dude loaded, brother. Watch, watch verse number 10. Look, if you still got your Bibles on, go all the way back to verse number 10. It says this in verse number 10. And the servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed. Watch it. For all the goods of his master, all the goods of Abraham are at his disposal. All the goods of Abraham, the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. The one who asked the question, the one who asked and gets to the place where wilt thou go with this man? This man, what about him? He's got all the goods of Abraham. He is filthy rich. What's he got? According to verse number 24 or verse 22, he's got gold. The Bible said in verse 22, he's got gold. You know what gold's a picture of? It's a picture of royalty in the Bible. This guy's royal. Matter of fact, the Bible said that Abraham was like a king. So that must mean if Abraham's like a king, his son's like a prince. I know of a king that's got a son who's called the prince of peace. Man, one night in my pew, Brother Kevin Stewart, I heard that good message of Jesus. And you know what I realized? They were offering me to go with somebody who's royalty, king of kings, lord of lords. I mean, brother, he owns it all this morning. He's rich. He ain't, just, he ain't just royalty. He's also, the Bible said in verse 53, that he had silver. You know what silver is a picture of in your Bible? It's a picture of redemption. He comes down there and he's going to buy, he's going to purchase a Gentile to go back and see that Jewish prince. Amen. Thank God that day I trusted Christ. He didn't just purchase me. He redeemed me this morning. He wasn't just royalty. He was the redeemer in my life. She don't just get riches, brother. She gets the riches of royalty. She gets the riches of redemption. And the Bible also said he gave her raiment. He gave her clothes. 
What's that raiment a picture of? That's a picture of righteousness. The Bible said, I've been covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The day that I accepted Christ as my Savior, I didn't just get into a royal family. I didn't just get redeemed from the fallen race of Adam. But I was covered not in my own self-righteous rags any longer. But I am covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, God's only Son. I got so much to preach on this, but I ain't got time to do it. She don't just get royalty. She don't just get redemption. She don't just get righteousness. But the Bible said in verse 61, he's got camels. What's that a picture of? He's, he, she got a ride. She got a ride. You say, what's that ride? You study about camels in your Bible, you'll find out they got all kind of pictures about grace. Brother, she don't, she don't have to make her walk back to Isaac. She gets a ride to Isaac. She's not riding, good gracious. She don't ride on her own power. She don't ride on her own strength. She is riding on the power and the strength of somebody else. I thought to myself when she saddled up Brother Randy on that camel, you know about camels? They double humped. There's a hump here. There's a hump here. You know what that means? Every time it hit the brakes real good, she couldn't fall off because she had something holding her in. Every time he took off real fast, she couldn't fall off. She had something behind her. Can I say I'm glad I'm riding on grace? I ain't trying to hold myself in Jesus. The grace of God is a hold me in this thing. Brother Kent, you know what they say about camels? They say about camels, Brother Kent, they say they got weird eyes. They're made for desert walking. You read about this, it's wild. They said that they have a film over their eyes that when they start walking through, <laughs> whew, I feel I'm on it. <laughs> when they start, Brother Travis, walking through sandstorms where you can't see, they said there's some God put in them camel's eyes, Brother Hunter, that when they start walking through them sandstorms, there's a film that comes over their eyes that they can keep their eyes wide open and keep walking right on through the storms in the desert. Can I tell y'all, I'm glad I'm riding on grace. And it is grace that brought us safe thus far. And grace will lead us home. The grace of God can take you through any storm. The grace of God can take you through any dust up that the devil throws in your life. They said them, Brother Skip, they say them camels are awesome because they have many chambers in their stomach. That's why they drink so much water. Brother Craig, they'll drink a whole pile of water because they got all these chambers. And a camel can fill up on that side of the desert and he don't have to stop again. He can walk clear to the other side of the desert. He can walk through dry places with his passenger. He can walk through dusty places with his passenger and he can just keep on going. I'm glad when I got saved, I trusted somebody that's got enough grace to Get me through the dry times of life. Get me through the deserts of life. He's rich. You'd be crazy not to trust Jesus this morning. I mean, I just, I, I, I just thought to myself, she'd be crazy not to accept this. Why? Because he's rich. i tell you why she'd been crazy not to accept it. Because this rich guy was ready. He's just waiting on her. Watch what your Bible said in verse 54. You still got your Bibles open there? Look at verse 54. He's ready. Verse 54, and they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning, and he said, he's ready to go, send me away unto my master. Let's go. Let's go right now. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. Come on. Come on. We got to go right now. Verse 55, and her brother and her mother said, let the damsel abide with us a few days. At the least ten after that she shall go. And he said unto them, Hinder me not. I'm ready to go. Seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. Here we find he's ready to go. He said, Come on, girl. Come on. Let's load up. We got to go. We got to go. Now's the time. Now's the time. And isn't it something that every time God begins to offer grace to somebody, there's a crowd standing there. Her family was standing there and they said, don't leave yet. Oh, don't. Let's wait. Let's wait. Let, look, look. We're not no getting carried away on this decision here now. 
Ho, 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 ho. Let's just hold up on this thing. You know, let, let's wait a few days. Let this simmer down. What's the rush? What's the rush? Let's put it off till another day. Hey, listen, you sitting there this morning and the Lord speaking to your heart and saying, you're to come to me. You're to come to Jesus. They've been singing about the blood and how to get born again. I'm preaching about Jesus this morning coming to where you are and calling you to himself. And the first thing the devil starts telling you is, just wait. There'll be another church service another day. Maybe not. It weren't here just a, lot, just a little while back that I got a text on a Sunday afternoon from a fella who said, hey, I'm going to be there tonight, Sunday night. He said, I'm done playing games with God. I ain't playing games no more. I'll be there Sunday night. Well, he didn't show up Sunday night, Brother John, and he was dead from a car crash on Wednesday and went off into eternity. Young fella, my age. Hey, 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 you ain't promised tomorrow. That devil sit on your shoulder and say, hey, you got a party to go to. You got friends to keep up in prayer. Don't get saved today. Just put it off till tomorrow. But he's ready. And he says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. You might be dead and in hell before the week is over. You come while he's calling. He's rich. Why would she not have come? He's rich. He's ready. He was requesting. They request. Will thou go with this man? He makes the request. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance this morning. So listen to me. Listen to me. If, if this man's rich and he's ready and he's requesting, thank God this woman jumped on and she realized, man, that's right. I'm going. I will go. But I look at this and I wonder to myself, Brother Zach, why is it that so many people, when they are offered God's mercy and God's grace, why is it so many people, they don't just jump on the offer? Why is it I watch some people lost without God come to our church and sit service after service, week after week? And there'll be people getting saved around them. And you know you need to get saved. And God's dealing with your heart. But you'll walk right back out and go right back out to your sin when God is calling and the Lord is dealing and saying, won't you come to me? Will you go with me? Won't you come? I wonder to myself, what in the world is holding you back? For a few minutes this morning, I'm just going to preach real short. I'm preaching on this thought. Why wouldn't you want to go? It said here in the text, wilt thou go with this man? I'm preaching on why, why wouldn't you want to go? What in the world's holding you back this morning from just saying, you know what, forget it. I'm going to that altar, and I'm going to repent of my sins and trust Jesus Christ by faith. Why, why wouldn't you want to? Right. He's rich. He's ready. He, he, he's receiving. He's requesting. Why wouldn't you go? And I find there's some things in the text. There's some things in the text that Rebecca does that many people do not do. This is why she ended up getting to the place where she said, I'll go, and why many people don't. Can I, can I throw three things out and we'll be done? Number one, I see some people won't go because they have no room. Some people just don't have no room. Look at what your Bible said here down in verse number 23. This man has is, is, is just met Rebecca at this well. He's just met Rebecca at the well. Look at verse number 23. And he said, whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee. Watch it. Is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? She said unto him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She said moreover unto him, watch what she says. We have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. What a difference. What a difference, Brother Joe Fur, in, in this woman saying, oh yes, we've got room for you. Just come on. What a difference in this and Luke chapter 2 verse 7 when your Savior came into the world and he came into Bethlehem and the Bible said he had to be born in a manger. Why? Because there was no room for him in the end. You know why some people won't go with the Lord? You know why some people won't receive the Lord this morning? Because they just ain't got no room. 
Your life's just too full for Jesus. You got so much stuff packed in your life. You got so many things in your life that you know this. If I let Jesus in, I got to kick that out. If Jesus comes in the front door, I got to kick that right there out the back door because I know Jesus and that can't be up in the same place at the same time. And some of y'all this morning, you would just rather have all of your full garbage up in your house than you would Jesus Christ coming in and abiding in your life, changing your life, giving light and liberty and hope and joy in your life. You, you think to yourself, you think all that stuff in your life that's keeping you from getting saved, you think all that matters. Not without him it don't. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I'm just curious. Do you have any room for Jesus this morning? Is your life so packed up that you literally ain't got no room to put Jesus anywhere? See, that's the problem with modern day, uh, modern day even church is we try and give people Jesus and you can still keep everything else. That's not Bible salvation. Bible salvation is we turn to Christ and we forsake that. We do an about face. Uh, I want Jesus more than I want anything else. Uh, and what you think is, what you think is all that stuff in your life, it's making your life full. You think your friends... And you think your parties, and you think your dope, and you think your liquor, and you think your little religious phylactery, you think all that's making your life full. But the truth is, your life is empty. Your life is void. Your life is dark without Jesus in it. And the best decision you'll ever make is saying, I got room for the Lord. Come on in, Lord. I'm throwing my heart wide open. I'm tired of being without Christ. I'm tired of being without hope. Come on in. Listen to me. Listen to me. If you think that the Lord is just going to grab you, throw you in an altar, override your will, and come in and save you, you've lost your mind. That's right. Amen. I don't care what nobody says or what nobody preaches. If you think for a minute that the Bible teaches that God's just going to override your will and jerk you up, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you why in a lot of places there's a lot of people going to hell because they've heard all their life. They've heard this. Well... God's sheep's going to get saved when God's sheep's going to get saved. And if they're God's sheep, they're coming. You know what I would do if I was some young person growing up in that? I'd probably say, well, whenever God gets ready for me to come, he'll just yank me down there. Until then, I'm going to go do what I want to do. No, 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 no. This is God speaking to you right now. This, you, you say, I ain't heard God speaking to me. You're hearing him right now. We beseech you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. I'm speaking in place of the Lord, and I'm begging you, come. And you're hearing it. That is God dealing with your heart. I ain't got no room for the Lord this morning. You better start getting some room for the Lord. This woman right here, she said, I got room. I got room. Come on in. I want you in my life. I want you in my heart. I have plenty of room this morning. Some people have no room for the Lord. Let me say, not only, what well, when you want to go, she, she, she went. She had room. Some people ain't got no room. Let me say this. Some people have no respect. Watch her respect. Look, look down, if you would, at verse number 27. This, this servant and Rebecca, they're having this talk. Watch the respect. Watch verse 27. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham. He has now identified that he serves the Lord God of heaven, and he is the servant of Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. And the damsel ran. She's doing something with what she heard. And the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house these things. She heard and she responded. Why? Because she respected God's servant and God's words. You don't know why some people won't come to Christ? They have no respect for the word of God and for the servant of God. You come in here and you think this is, just, this is just another TV infomercial. This is just another TV program. We come in. This is the place we come to take our nap. This is the cu- place we come to, you know, break our snacks out and sit there and act like we're watching a TV program. That's one thing. I'm just be honest with you. We ain't never going back to yard church. Anybody got ideas? We're going back to yard church again. You might as well just fold that up, put it in your pipe and smoke it. We ain't going back to yard church. Pray to God. I don't care if COVID 25.0 comes back. We ain't going back to yard church. We'll put a tent up and we'll gather in a tent. But if we're going to park cars again, I know you say, why not? Because it was like a circus. 
Say, what do you mean by that, preacher? I mean, look, look, y'all. I'm standing up on the platform. And I ain't hammering on nobody. It's just the way it was. And everybody's got their cars parked out there. And while I'm up there preaching my guts out, I'm looking. There's people sitting in lawn chairs popping Cokes open. Got M&Ms in this hand, a Coke in this hand. It's like they at the county fair watching some dude up there perform. That ain't church. They, they got to be a level of respect in this thing. We've come to meet with God. We haven't come to play on our phone. We haven't come to play games. We haven't come to doodle. We can do that at the house. We came because we want to hear God's man preach God's word. And we are listening for God to speak to us. Now, I will admit this, Brother Tyler. That's just the facts. I will admit this. The problem in this day, why people don't have any respect for church or for preachers anymore, is there's a lot of preachers that they haven't earned that respect, and they absolutely flush some of that respect down the drain. Yeah, they tainted the relationship of what preachers should be. Amen, amen. I mean, look here. Cert, certain preachers, if this would have been certain servants of God, when she showed up at the well, he'd have started hitting on her. Hey, baby, you looking good. What's going on? Ain't, ain't you a servant of Abraham? Yeah, but that's all right. I'm, no, 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 no. I tell you what's give a bad rap to the ministry is so many men got such bad morals. Listen, listen to me. I love you and I'm your friend, but more than that, I'm God's man and God's servant. And I'm not called to come here and just be buddies. I'm called to tell you what God has said. And there's got to be a level of respect to the preaching and the preacher this morning. Amen. We used to live in a day in our country. We used to live in a day in our country, Brother Stockner, where there was a level of, man, that, that's the church. That's the Bible. We've raised a generation that's just totally lost that. I don't know what's happened. We just, Brother Jason, we've totally lost any respect towards God in this house anymore. You don't know why some people won't get saved? They just don't see it as serious. Hey, Mama, hey, Daddy, you know why some, people, some of your youngins ain't going to get saved? Because they've heard every time you walk out that door, you've tore down everything that's been preached. You've mocked and laughed and ridiculed everything that's been done from the pulpit to the pew. And they say, well, this thing ain't serious. Why do we need God? Why do we need the church? It's just one big joke. It ain't no joke. It's serious this morning. And I want to make sure people know we've come to hear from God. You know what the job of this servant was? According to verse number five, when this servant talks with Abraham, this was the job of the servant. The job of the servant was said this in verse five. The servant said, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? So on and so forth. You know what the job of this servant was? The job was simply this. It wasn't to hog tie some woman, throw her on the back of the camel, kicking and screaming and gag her and bring her back. No, no, no. It was just to offer the opportunity. Brother Chad, this is my job this morning. I'm simply offering you an opportunity to meet Jesus. That's what her job, his job was. His job was, won't you come meet Isaac? Come meet Isaac. You know what I'm offering? Come meet Jesus. Brother Devon, I am called to tell people about the Lord Jesus, and it's your choice whether you do or not. I can't hog tie you and drag you, but I am called to tell you and compel you why won't some people come? No respect, no room. Lastly, I'm done with this. Here's why some people don't come. No recognition. No recognition. No, no realization of what's really going on. Why, why, would, why won't some people come? Why won't some people go? No recognition. Watch, watch when you really realize this is awesome to me. This, Brother Skip, this blesses my heart. When you really see how much orchestration there was for this woman to accept this offer... If you only knew, I want to spoil it. Look at verse 11. Watch verse 11. Let's read a few verses here together. This is beautiful. Watch verse 11. He comes into the country of Mesopotamia and watch verse 11. Watch all of the orchestration of God in this. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening. Even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. He's talking to God. Now watch it. And let it come to pass that the damsel whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher. I pray thee that I may drink. 
And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. Watch it, verse 15. And it came to pass before he had done speaking that, behold, Rebekah came out who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. What? Watch God answering this prayer. And she said, Drink, my Lord. And she hasted, let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, Just what he, she, he'd been praying. I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again under the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man wandering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord has made his journey prosperous or not. Listen to me. Tell my recognition. Brother Carl, she had no idea. Had no idea how much orchestration of God there was. To bring her to this place at this time to meet this. Y'all, I, I can't even fathom. I can't even fathom, Brother Collins. Brother Ken, I can't even fathom how much God had to do and orchestrate for this. For Abraham to walk to that servant on the right day and say, Hey, take off going to Mesopotamia and go get me a wife for Isaac, my son. Okay? All the things God had to either allow into that servant's path to stop him by about 10 minutes so he wouldn't get there too early or too late. All the things that God had to remove out of his path so he got there just at the right time. All the things that God had to do in her life to make sure she got there. To right. But brother God has worked it all out. God has moved things out of the way. God, So that right here, at this right time, this man would show up. That girl would show up. And the offer might go out. Will you go with me? She had no idea how much God had been doing before she ever showed up. And some of y'all this morning, you have no idea that you're not here by accident. <laughs> Good God. You have no idea. You are not here by accident. This is a divine appointment this morning. You think, no, I just got up this morning and decided I needed a little bit of religion. I needed to go down there to church. Or I just decided somebody invited me. So I, no, 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 no. There was somebody behind the scenes uh, pulling strings, uh, moving stuff out of the way. You're not here by accident. You're here because somebody wants to meet you. You're here because somebody wants you to go out that door different than you came in. You're here this morning because there's a God in heaven that has divinely orchestrated things. I think to myself, Brother Skip, what all God had to orchestrate for an 18-year-old boy to wind up at Northside Baptist Church at Timbrook, Georgia on a Monday night and hear that preacher preach on Ezekiel 37 and the Valley of the Dry Bones. And I think, thank God, God was a setting it up. You can look back in your life child of God looking back and say look what God did how God set this up and orchestrated that how in God's name did he do that I don't know but I'm glad he brought me to that place and gave me an opportunity to trust Christ really 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 why wouldn't you want to go do you really think that God's going to orchestrate all that in your life and you're going to hear me talk about it this morning and then you're going to say yeah. And you really think God's going to let you slide on that? Yeah. God takes serious his orchestrations, yep. his movements, and how he sets things up. He's giving you an opportunity. I thought to myself about this, Brother Skip. She had no recognition and no idea what God had already put in place for her to receive his servant on that day. But I'll tell you this. She had no idea not only what God had done right there, she had no idea what God was going to do way out there either. Oh, she didn't have no idea. Look at what they say when they send her off. Come down toward the end of the chapter. Look what they say when they send her off. Come all the way down here to verse number 60. Verse 60, she has said, I will go. And watch what it said in verse 60. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister. 
Be thou the mother of thousands and of millions. She was. You say, that woman had that many children? No, I'm talking about by proxy. I'm going to tell you this just a minute. Just hang on. And let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. Do you know how much? She had no idea how much God was going to bless her on this. Brother Randall, she ends up going down there and meeting Isaac. And by that same token, let me pause right here and say this. She had no idea what she was getting. But you go down there and read it. She comes into the land and she looks and she sees a man walking in the evening. And she looks at that servant and said, who is that? Woo! <laughs> that stud muffin, who is that? And he said, that's the one I've been, <laughs> that's the one I've been telling you about. He's so much better than what I could even describe, ain't he, Rebecca? He's more wonderful than I could even tell you about. That's Jesus, friend. <laughs> I'll just pause right here and say one of these days, we're going to step off on that side, and we're going to see him in all his glory, and we're going to say, he's so much more wonderful. He's so much fairer. He's so much better than we ever dreamed possible. But she has no recognition of this. She goes down there with Isaac, and the Bible says, Brother Udi, she has boys, twin boys. And one of them's named Esau, but there's another one she has. His name's Jacob. Oh, old Jacob, he has them 12 boys. Them's called the 12 tribes of the children of, and y'all know where that name, what that name Israel even comes from? That's her boy, Jacob. God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. That's hers. That's her young. I don't know about you, but I got to think to myself sitting somewhere in a house years down the road. Rebecca's sitting there and she's saying, good gracious mercy me. Look what God has done. I had no idea as just a little old girl back over there that me calling and saying I'll go with this man. I had no idea this is what God was going to do with my life. But look how God has used my life to be a blessing in so many other people's lives. Some of y'all this morning, maybe there's some young person, some young child this morning. You ain't saved, but this morning God's dealing with your heart and God's saying, come to me. And you've got no idea. Some of y'all, boy, I'm telling you what, as a teenage boy, when God saved me, I never, Brother Xander, thought God had ever let me do what I'm doing. I was just a little old 18-year-old run. And I didn't think God had ever let me preach a message. Didn't think God had ever let me pastor a church. But I look back now and say, it all started because of that night that night I said I'll go you got no idea what God could do with your life and God would do through your life if you just come this morning and say I'll go my question is why wouldn't you he's rich he's ready he'll receive you is it because you don't got no room Esther play something for us over here is it, is it because you've got no respect for what I'm talking about? You just think this is a big old joke. You won't one day. Is it because you just don't recognize and realize all that God has graciously done to bring you to this place and this time? Is it because you think your life will be better off if you ran the show and you piloted your own ship? Uh, you have no idea just how good it is to be a child of God. Brother Eddie, we had no idea. <laughs> Just that little old prayer would come to an altar and say, Oh God, I'm lost, save me. Had no idea. Had no idea how good it was going to be. Had no idea how wonderful it was going to be. Some of y'all, you remember when your family was just absolutely shot. And one little invitation would you come? Would you go with me? One little reception to an invitation totally changed everything. Changed the course, changed, changed it all. And at that time, you just had no idea. You thought, I, I just want to get saved from the fire. Oh, but he was doing so much more than that. 
I wonder this morning, why wouldn't you come? Why wouldn't you? Won't you come to him this morning? They asked her, will thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. This morning, why don't you tell the devil to take a hike? He's telling you, just put it off till another day. Why don't you just come to this altar and say, Lord, I'm coming. If you got lost loved ones, lost family, won't you come pray for them? Ask God to set things up in their life so they come to Christ. Let's all stand this morning. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, I pray that you take the word of God. Do a work with it bigger than what we can do. Speak to our hearts now. Save some sinner for Jesus' sake. Let them come. Let them come. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.